Welcome to BookTube, where we bring the timeless literature of the public domain to life through immersive audio experiences. From Jane Austen to Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare to Mark Twain, we bring you the most beloved classic books, now free to access and enjoy, read by beautiful AI voices. So sit back, relax, and let us transport you to a world of timeless stories and enduring characters, all available for free. Subscribe now and never miss an episode of BookTube Audio. You are listening to Study in Scarlet by Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter 1 Mr. Sherlock Holmes Study in Scarlet is the first novel in the Sherlock Holmes series written by Arthur Conan Doyle. In Chapter 1, the reader is introduced to Dr. John Watson, a recently returned military doctor who is in search of a place to stay in London. He is introduced to a man named Stamford who tells him about a friend of his, Sherlock Holmes, who is looking for a flatmate. Stamford describes Holmes as an eccentric and brilliant man who is a consulting detective. Watson visits Holmes at his flat in Baker Street and is immediately struck by the detective's keen observation skills and logical thinking. Holmes is described as having sharp, hawk-like features and a thin, angular face. He is also shown to be a man of few words and prefers to observe and deduce rather than engage in small talk. Holmes shows Watson around his flat, which is cluttered with various scientific equipment and books on a variety of subjects. Watson is impressed by Holmes's knowledge and intelligence, and agrees to take the room next to his. The chapter sets the stage for the mystery that will unfold throughout the novel and establishes Holmes as the main character and protagonist. It also introduces the reader to Holmes's unique methods of detective work and establishes his reputation as a highly analytical and logical detective with a keen eye for detail. In this chapter, we also find out that Holmes is currently not working on any case and seems to be living a life of leisure. In Chapter 2 of A Study in Scarlet, Sherlock Holmes explains to Dr. Watson the methods of his detective work, which he refers to as the science of deduction. He begins by pointing out that all human beings leave behind a trail of clues in the form of physical evidence, such as footprints, fingerprints, and clothing fibers, as well as behavioral evidence, such as habits and mannerisms. Holmes explains that his job as a detective is to observe and interpret these clues to deduce the truth about a crime or situation. He uses the example of a visitor to his flat, a gentleman who had recently returned from India, to illustrate his methods. Holmes can deduce the man's occupation, recent travels, and even his personal history, just by observing his clothes, jewelry, and mannerisms. Holmes then goes on to demonstrate his method of deduction by elimination. He explains that by ruling out certain possibilities, one can arrive at the most likely explanation. He also emphasizes the importance of attention to detail, saying that the little things are infinitely the most important. Watson is fascinated by Holmes's methods and is impressed by the detective's ability to deduce so much from seemingly insignificant clues. However, he also notes that Holmes's deductions are not always entirely accurate and that he is prone to jumping to conclusions. In this chapter, we see how Sherlock Holmes's method of observation, logical thinking, and elimination is a key aspect of his detective work, and how even the smallest of details can help in solving a case. It also highlights how Holmes's methods contrast with the traditional police investigation techniques of the time. The chapter serves as an introduction to the central theme of the novel, the use of science and reason to solve crimes. It establishes Holmes as a master of the science of deduction and sets the stage for the mystery that will unfold throughout the novel. In Chapter 3 of A Study in Scarlet, Dr. Watson becomes increasingly interested in Sherlock Holmes's methods of detective work. He observes Holmes solving a minor case which he calls the Lauriston Garden Mystery. This case involves a missing Scottish nobleman named Mr. James Windebank who is suspected of embezzlement. Holmes receives a letter from a woman named Miss Susan Cushing, 
who believes that her stepdaughter, Miss Violet Smith, has been wronged by Mr. Windebank. Holmes agrees to take the case, and he and Watson visit Miss Cushing at her home in Lauriston Gardens. Holmes begins his investigation by observing the surroundings and questioning Miss Cushing and Miss Smith. He discovers that Mr. Windebank had been leading a double life and had been posing as a French nobleman, Monsieur Henri Fournay, to defraud a wealthy widow, Miss Emily Doric, out of her money. Holmes and Watson then visit Miss Doric's house, where they find evidence of Mr. Windebank's deception. Holmes can deduce that Mr. Windebank is the missing nobleman and that he had fled the country with the stolen money. In this chapter, we see Holmes using his powers of observation and deduction to solve a minor case, which was not a murder case but still a crime. We also see how Holmes's methods of detective work can uncover the truth about a situation and bring justice to those who have been wronged. This chapter highlights the importance of thorough investigation and attention to detail in solving crimes, and how even small-scale cases can have far-reaching consequences. It also serves as an example of how Holmes's methods of detective work can be applied to various types of cases. In Chapter 4 of A Study in Scarlet, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson investigate another minor case, which they call, What John Rance Had to Tell. The case involves John Rance, a neighbor of the Cushings, who had come to Holmes with a strange story. Rance tells Holmes that his fiancée, a woman named Alice Faulkner, had disappeared without a trace and that he suspected that she had been kidnapped by a rival suitor. Rance had received a letter from a man named Charles McCarthy, who claimed to have kidnapped Alice and demanded a large sum of money for her release. Holmes and Watson investigate the case and discover that Alice had not been kidnapped but had run away with McCarthy. They also learn that McCarthy had been blackmailing Rance, threatening to reveal a secret from Rance's past if he did not pay him the ransom. After Holmes and Watson confront McCarthy, he confesses to his scheme and returns the money to Rance. Alice returns home, and Rance and Alice's engagement is called off. In this chapter, we see Holmes using his powers of observation, deduction, and confrontation to solve a case that was not a murder case but a crime of extortion. We also see how Holmes's methods of detective work can be applied to cases involving deception and blackmail. This chapter highlights the importance of not jumping to conclusions and how even small-scale cases can have significant consequences. It also serves as an example of how Holmes's methods of detective work can be applied to various types of cases. In Chapter 5 of A Study in Scarlet, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson place an advertisement in the newspaper seeking information about a missing person named Neville St. Clair. The advertisement brings a visitor to their door, a man named Mr. Hutchison, who claims to have information about the missing man. Hutchison tells Holmes and Watson that he had seen Neville St. Clair in the company of a beggar and that they had been acting suspiciously. He gives them a description of the beggar, and Holmes can deduce that the beggar is Neville St. Clair in disguise. Holmes and Watson investigate further and discover that Neville St. Clair had been leading a double life as a beggar to support his family. He had become trapped in this life and was unable to escape. In this chapter, we see Holmes using his powers of observation, deduction, and confrontation to solve a case involving a missing person. We also see how Holmes's methods of detective work can be applied to cases involving deception and dual identities. This chapter highlights the importance of not jumping to conclusions and how even small-scale cases can have significant consequences. It also serves as an example of how Holmes's methods of detective work can be applied to various types of cases. It also shows how Holmes's advertisement helped him to solve the case. In Chapter 6 of A Study in Scarlet, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are visited by Inspector Tobias Gregson of Scotland Yard who is investigating the murder of Enoch Drebber. Gregson is Holmes's rival and is keen to prove that he is a better detective. Gregson tells Holmes and Watson that he has found a clue at the scene of the crime, 
a wedding ring belonging to Dreber and that he is confident that he will be able to solve the case. Holmes, however, is skeptical and points out that the ring is not a reliable clue, as it could have been planted at the scene by the murderer. Despite this, Gregson persists in his investigation and even arrests a suspect, a young man named Jefferson Hope. However, the suspect is later released due to a lack of evidence. In this chapter, we see the contrast between the traditional and the modern method of investigation where Gregson, representing the traditional method, is unable to solve the case by himself. We also see how Gregson's overconfidence in his abilities and the traditional method leads him to make mistakes and jump to conclusions. This chapter highlights the importance of thorough investigation and attention to detail in solving crimes, and how even small-scale cases can have far-reaching consequences. It also serves as an example of how traditional detective methods can be inadequate and how modern methods, like Holmes's, can be more effective in solving crimes. In Chapter 7 of A Study in Scarlet, Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes continue their investigation into the murder of Enoch Dreber. They found out that the murder weapon was a peculiar weapon, a heavy stick with a horn handle, and that the killer had written the word, rake, on the wall in blood. Holmes examines the scene of the crime and finds a few clues that lead him to suspect that the killer may be a man named Jefferson Hope. He also discovers that the word, rake, was not random, but a German word for revenge, which suggested a personal motivation for the murder. Watson and Holmes then visit a pawnbroker, where they find a man who sold the peculiar weapon to a man who fits the description of Hope. This confirms that Hope is the killer. They visit Hope's lodgings, but he is not there. However, they find a letter addressed to Dr. Watson, in which Hope confesses to the murder of Dreber and explains his reasons for doing so. He reveals that he had been in love with a woman named Lucy Ferrier, who had been falsely accused of treachery by a religious cult led by Joseph Stangerson. In this chapter, we see Holmes and Watson using their powers of observation, deduction, and elimination to piece together the events leading up to the murder, and how they can identify the killer as Jefferson Hope. We also see how a personal motivation, revenge, is the reason behind the murder and how the clues found at the crime scene helped them to find the killer. This chapter highlights the importance of the thorough investigation, attention to detail, and logical thinking in solving crimes. It also shows how even small clues can lead to the identification of the killer and how personal motivations can drive a person to commit a crime. In part two of A Study in Scarlet, the novel shifts to a backstory that explains the events leading up to the murder of Enoch Dreber. Chapter 1, On the Great Alkali Plain, begins with a description of the American West, specifically the Great Alkali Plain, an area of barren land in Utah. The chapter introduces the main characters of this part of the novel, Lucy Ferrier, her estranged father, and a religious cult led by Joseph Stangerson. Lucy Ferrier is a young woman who lives with her father in the small Mormon community of Salt Lake City. She is engaged to a man named John Ferrier, who is not her biological father, but has raised her as his daughter. Her father is a non-believer and is not well-liked by the community. The chapter also introduces Joseph Stangerson, the leader of a religious cult known as the Danny Tez, who are known for their strict adherence to the teachings of the Book of Mormon and their willingness to use violence to enforce their beliefs. Stan Gerson and his followers believe that Lucy's father is a heretic and want to force him to convert to their faith. They also want to marry Lucy to one of their members, to bring her into the fold. Lucy's father refuses to convert and is subsequently beaten by the Danny Tez. He is left for dead on the Great Alkali Plain but is rescued by a passing traveler. Lucy is forced to marry one of the Danny Tez, and her father is forced to flee the community. This chapter sets the stage for the backstory of the novel and establishes the main characters and their relationships with one another. It also introduces the religious conflict and violence that will play a major role in the novel's events. In Chapter 2 of A Study in Scarlet, 
Part 2, The Flower of Utah, we see the continuation of the backstory that explains the events leading up to the murder of Enoch Dreber. The chapter picks up where the previous chapter left off, with Lucy Ferrier having been forced to marry one of the Danny Tez, and her father forced to flee the community. Lucy is now living with her new husband, but is deeply unhappy and yearns to be reunited with her father. Meanwhile, Lucy's father has been wandering the Great Alkali Plain, barely surviving, and struggling to make a living. He is eventually found by a group of prospectors who take him in and help him to establish a new life. As the years pass, Lucy's father prospers and becomes a successful businessman. He never forgets his daughter and continues to search for her. At the same time, Lucy's husband, a member of the Danny Tez, becomes increasingly abusive and violent towards her. She is desperate to escape and eventually manages to flee to the city of St. Louis. In St. Louis, Lucy is reunited with her father and they begin a new life together. However, their happiness is short-lived as they soon learn that the Danny Tez have followed them to the city and are determined to take Lucy back to their community. This chapter continues to explore the backstory. In Chapter 3 of A Study in Scarlet, Part 2, John Ferrier talks with the Prophet, we continue to see the backstory that explains the events leading up to the murder of Enoch Dreber. The chapter picks up where the previous chapter left off, with Lucy Ferrier and her father living in St. Louis, but being pursued by the Danny Tez. They are confronted by the leader of the Danny Tez, Joseph Stan Gerson, who is now known as the Prophet. He demands that Lucy be returned to the community, but John Ferrier refuses, determined to protect his daughter. In an attempt to resolve the situation, John Ferrier agrees to meet with the Prophet, and they have a heated conversation. The Prophet makes it clear that he will not back down and that he will use any means necessary to get Lucy back. John Ferrier realizes that there is no way to peacefully resolve the situation and that he and Lucy will have to flee again. He decides to take Lucy and head west, where they can start a new life and be free from the Danny Tez. However, before they can leave, they are ambushed by the Danny Tez, and in the ensuing struggle, John Ferrier is killed, and Lucy is kidnapped and taken back to the community. This chapter explores the tension between John Ferrier and the Prophet, and the lengths that the Prophet and the Danny Tez are willing to go to get what they want. It also highlights the dangers and sacrifices of trying to escape from a cult, as John Ferrier was killed trying to protect his daughter. In Chapter 4 of A Study in Scarlet, Part 2, A Flight for Life, we continue to see the backstory that explains the events leading up to the murder of Enoch Dreber. The chapter begins with Lucy Ferrier being held captive by the Danny Tez and forced to marry their leader, Joseph Stan Gerson, now known as the Prophet. She is deeply unhappy and is determined to escape. After several months, Lucy can make her escape with the help of her friend, Rachel Howells, who is also a member of the community. They set out together on a dangerous journey across the Great Alkali Plain to reach the nearest railway station and escape to the east. As they journey, they face many obstacles, including harsh weather, lack of food and water, and pursuit by the Danny Tez. However, they are determined to reach safety, and they finally make it to the railway station. However, their journey is not over yet, as they soon learn that the Danny Tez have followed them, and they are forced to flee once again. In the end, they are rescued by a passing traveler, who helps them to reach the safety of a nearby town. In this chapter, we see the lengths that Lucy is willing to go to escape the Danny Tez, and the sacrifices she must make to achieve her freedom. We also see the dangers and difficulties that come with escaping from a cult and the determination and bravery required to succeed. In Chapter 5 of A Study in Scarlet, Part 2, The Avenging Angels, we continue to see the backstory that explains the events leading up to the murder of Enoch Dreber. The chapter picks up where the previous chapter left off, with Lucy Ferrier and Rachel Howells having escaped from the Danny Tez and reached safety in a nearby town. 
They are now living under new identities and trying to start a new life. However, their peace is short-lived as they soon learn that the Danites have not given up their pursuit. They send a group of their members, known as, the Avenging Angels, to track down and capture Lucy. The Avenging Angels, led by a man named Jefferson Hope, are ruthless and will stop at nothing to capture Lucy and bring her back to the community. They begin to terrorize the town, using violence and intimidation to try to find her. Lucy and Rachel are forced to flee once again and they eventually seek refuge in a boarding house run by a woman named Mrs. Etheridge. However, even there, they are not safe as the avenging angels find them and attempt to take them by force. In this chapter, we see the persistence and brutality of the Danny Tez and their avenging angels in their pursuit of Lucy. We also see the impact of their actions on the people of the town and the lengths that Lucy and Rachel must go to to stay safe. It also shows how far these fanatics are willing to go to get what they want. In Chapter 6 of A Study in Scarlet, Part 2, a continuation of the reminiscences of John Watson, M.D., the story returns to the present day, where Dr. Watson is narrating the events that led to the murder of Enoch Dreber. The chapter begins with Dr. Watson explaining that he has been telling the backstory of Lucy Ferrier and the Danny Tez to provide context for the murder of Enoch Dreber. He then reveals that the man who had killed Dreber, Jefferson Hope, was none other than the leader of the Avenging Angels, who had been hunting for Lucy Ferrier. Watson goes on to explain that Hope had finally found Lucy and Dreber together in St. Louis and had killed Dreber in a fit of jealous rage. He then explains how Sherlock Holmes and the police were able to track down and arrest Hope for the murder. In this chapter, we see how the backstory of Lucy Ferrier and the Danny Tez ties into the murder of Enoch Dreber, and how the events of the past led to the tragic outcome in the present. It also serves as a reminder that the past can have a profound impact on the present and that it is important to understand the background of a crime before trying to solve it. In the final chapter of A Study in Scarlet, the conclusion, we see the resolution of the murder case and the aftermath of the events that have been described throughout the novel. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson can prove that Jefferson Hope is the killer of Enoch Dreber, and he is arrested and brought to trial. Hope is found guilty of murder and is sentenced to death. Before his execution, Hope tells the story of his past and how it led him to commit the murder. He explains how he had been in love with Lucy Ferrier and how he had been driven to kill Dreber out of jealousy and a desire for revenge. As the story comes to a close, Dr. Watson reflects on the lessons that he has learned from working with Sherlock Holmes. He notes how Holmes's methods of observation, deduction, and reasoning have helped him to better understand the criminal mind and how to solve crimes. In this chapter, we see the resolution of the murder case and the punishment of the guilty party, Jefferson Hope. It also serves as a reminder that even the most heinous of crimes can have a backstory and reasons behind them. The chapter also highlights the importance of understanding the criminal mind and the role of observation and reasoning in solving crimes. Thanks for listening to today's episode of BookTube. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe to our channel, we have many more classic books to come. Leave a comment and let us know what you thought of today's episode, and don't forget to share our channel with your friends and family. They too can enjoy the timeless literature of the past through our immersive audio experiences. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode of BookTube Audio.